Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused Commander decks. A focused Commander deck is more attuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Commander's Quarters decks are built within a $25 budget. That's $25 for 100 cards. And prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started today, though, make sure you go check out our new classic pink playmat and Commander's Quarters t-shirts on thecommandersquarters.com. And thank you to everyone who's already purchased our merchandise. It really does help support the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click that little bell notification icon so that you can stay up to date on the latest Commander's Quarters episodes. Today's commander is Lavinia Azorius Renegade. Lavinia is a 2-2 human soldier that costs a white and a blue. She says each opponent can't cast non-creature spells with converted mana cost greater than the number of lands that player controls. Also, whenever an opponent casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, counter that spell. So some people say that Lavinia is a way to make Commander a little more fair. She can help shut down some strategies that are ramping too quickly or casting too many things for free. But since her effects are one-sided and don't affect us, we can really abuse this and take advantage of it. So what's our strategy for this deck? Well, we want to control the board and slow down our opponents. Azorius commanders tend to focus on control and Lavinia is no different. We're going to be playing the long game, so we need to make sure that we can stay alive long enough to set ourselves up to win. And then how exactly do we win with this deck? Well, we're going to take advantage of her one-sided effect and then lock our opponents out. There are some cards that are just straight up oppressive when it comes to combining them with our commander. So we're going to lean into those cards and really take advantage of Lavinia's effects. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's start with our first tactic. Tactic number one, Mineral Magic. First up, there's Prismatic Lens, which can either tap for a colorless, or we can use it to filter our mana. And then there's Unstable Obelisk, which only taps for a colorless as well, but we can also pay 7 into it to tap and sacrifice it to destroy target permanent. Again, we're playing the long game with this deck, so this effect can really come in handy. Next up, there's Marble Diamond, which enters the battlefield tapped and taps for a white. And then we're running Sphere of Suns, which enters the battlefield tapped, and we can tap it 3 times to add 1 mana of any color to our mana pool. And Star Compass is also going to enter the battlefield tapped, and it can tap for either of our colors depending on our land situation. Next up, we're running three mana rocks that each just tap for two colorless mana. Worn Power Stone only costs us three mana, but it does enter the battlefield tapped, whereas Urgolum Zion Sisse's Ring both enter the battlefield untapped, but they cost four. Our opponents may be slowed down by Lavinia's one sided effect, but we definitely won't be. So we're also going to be running Everflowing Chalice, which can tap for half the amount of mana that we put into it. And Astral Cornucopia is very similar, but it only gives us back one third the amount of mana that we put into it. But unlike Everflowing Chalice, it does produce colored mana. Next up is Pyramid of the Pantheon, which we can pay 2 into it to tap it to add 1 mana of any color to our mana pool, and then we put a brick counter on Pyramid of the Pantheon. Once it has 3 brick counters on it, we can tap it to add 3 mana of any one color to our mana pool. Next up we've got 3 mana rocks that pretty much do the exact same thing but at different levels. Mindstone can tap for a colorless, or we can pay 1 into it to tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. Hedron Archive does the exact same thing but at 2 mana and 2 cards. And same with Dreamstone Hedron but with 3 mana and 3 cards. And finally we've got 2 mana rocks that ramp us, fix our mana, and can also draw us a card or two. Azorius Cluestone can tap for either of our colors and we can pay a white and a blue into it to tap and sacrifice it to draw a card. And Azorius Locket can also tap for either of our colors and we can pay 4 Azorius into it to tap and sacrifice it to draw 2 cards. We're running plenty of ways to ramp this deck so we can have more and more options when it comes to casting spells. We want to make sure that we can cast some big impactful spells on a moment's notice. So let's go through some of those big spells in tactic number two, drop the hammer. First up is mass calcify which is going to destroy all non-white creatures. We need to make sure that our wraths are not only impactful but also that they keep Lavinia alive. So while Lavinia keeps our opponents in check, we're keeping our opponent's creatures in check. So we're also going to be running dusk which is going to destroy all creatures with power three or greater. Now, Solar Tide can do the exact same thing, or we can choose to destroy all creatures with power 2 or less. Generally, we're not going to be picking this option, but we can if we need to. Next up is Slaughter the Strong, which says, Each player chooses any number of creatures he or she controls with total power of 4 or less, then sacrifices all other creatures he or she controls. This is a very effective card for its mana cost, and can even get rid of indestructible creatures too. And finally, there's Divine Reckoning, which says, Each player chooses a creature he or she controls, destroy the rest. On top of that, it's got a flashback for 5 white white, so we can even cast this a second time. Again, the goal of this deck is to keep our commander alive while we're controlling the board and slowing down our opponents. So let's go through some ways to protect Lavinia and ourselves in tactic number three, everyone is safe. First up, there's Nurex Stealth Suit, which is going to give Lavinia Shroud. It either costs us one to equip, or we can even pay blue blue to attach it at instant speed. And Mask of Avacyn is going to give her plus one plus two in Hexproof, but it costs a little more to equip. Next up, we're going to be running Spiritual Asylum, which says creatures and lands you control have Shroud, and whenever a creature you control attacks, sacrifice Spiritual Asylum. Now that second part is a downside in most decks, but in this deck we're really not going to attack with any creatures until we're completely set up to win. Now we've talked about protecting Lavinia, but what about protecting ourselves? In this deck we're going to be running Baird, Steward of Argive. Baird says creatures can't attack you or a planeswalker you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. While this may seem like a very small taxing effect, it is a great way to deter attacks. 
And finally, if our opponents do attack us, we do have some tricks up our sleeve with Illusionist Gambit and Reigns of Power. Illusionist Gambit basically forces the opponent that attacked us to take all those creatures back and swing at someone else with them. Depending on our opponent's board states, this can be absolutely detrimental to all of them. And then with Reigns of Power, we basically switch our creatures with someone else's, so we can just use those to block. This can even be a surprise finisher in the right situation if we want to use those creatures to attack. Since we're in Azorian's deck, we want to make sure that we're in control of what happens and that we make the rules. So let's make sure that our opponents are playing by our rules in tactic number 4, Fair Play. First up, there's Avon Mind Sensor, which has Flash in it. It says if an opponent would search a library, that player searches the top four cards of that library instead. This card can be absolutely detrimental against any tutor effects and even just any search for land effects. And then we're running Kismet, which says artifacts, creatures, and lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. This is a fantastic way to slow all of our opponents down and even leave some of them open. And next up, we've got some ways to deal with some pesky non-land permanents with Oblation and Release to the Wind. Oblation is an instant that says the owner of target non-land permanent shuffles it into his or her library, then draws two cards. And two cards is a very small price to pay for getting rid of the biggest threat on the board. And then Release to the Wind says exile target non-land permanent. For as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may cast it without paying its mana cost. And since our commander doesn't allow our opponents to cast things for free, this card can come in huge. On top of that, it's pretty flexible since we can use it to save one of our non-land permanents if we need to. Next up, we're going to be running some counter spells with Negate, Unwind, and Rewind. Negate and Unwind both counter target non-creature spell. But on top of that, Unwind also untaps up to 3 lands. Rewind is similar, but it can counter any kind of spell, and it untaps up to 4 lands. And then there's Spell Spindle, which not only counters a spell, but it can also temporarily ramp us. It's going to create X treasure tokens, where X is the spell's converted mana cost that it countered. And finally, we're going to be running Blatant Thievery, which says for each opponent, gain control of target permanent that player controls. This is a fantastic card that can even just win us the game in the right situation. But what if we don't have Blatant Thievery, and our opponents already have some great things on the board? Let's talk about some ways to deal with those in tactic number 5, Return on Investment. First up there's Aetherize, which is going to return all attacking creatures to their owner's hand. This can really set back a deck that depends on swinging out with creatures. And then we're going to be running Whelming Wave, which is going to return all creatures to their owner's hand, except for Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, and Serpents. Now the majority of decks aren't going to be running these creature types, so it's pretty much just going to bounce every creature back to their owner's hand. Now while this does hit Lavinia, she only costs us 2 mana to recast, so that's no big deal. Next up there's Aether Gale, which is a little more targeted on what it bounces. It says return 6 target non-land permanents to their owner's hand. This is an incredible value for only 5 mana and can really set our opponents back. And then there's River's Rebuke, which is going to be absolutely backbreaking to one of our opponents because it's going to return all non-land permanents they control back to their hand. So not only does this set them back, but it can make them into a huge target for everyone else. And finally, we're going to be running Karn's Temporal Sundering, which is a legendary sorcery, so we can only cast it if we've got a legendary creature or planeswalker on the field. It says target player takes an extra turn after this one, return up to one target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, exile card Temporal Sundering. So this card can really help us set up a big play and help us get rid of one of our opponent's permanents. So what are some of those big plays that we can have in this deck? Let's go through some of them now in tactic number 6, Landlocked. First up there's Mana Breach, which says whenever a player plays a spell, that player has to return a land back to their hand. And because of Lavinia's first effect, this hurts even more for our opponents. Because the fewer lands they have, the fewer non-creature spells that they can play. And losing a few or even all of our lands isn't a problem at a certain part of the game. Because Lavinia's effect is very one-sided, we're still able to run a ton of mana rocks in the stack. So once we're set up, we can cast something like Global Ruin to absolutely destroy all of our opponents. Global Ruin says each player chooses from the lands they control a land of each basic land type, then sacrifices the rest. So at the very most, our opponents are going to be left with just a few lands, and if we're playing against a monocolor deck, they're just going to have one. Even though we'll be down to two lands, it doesn't matter to us because again, we're going to be set up with a ton of mana rocks that can produce a ton of mana. So we're also going to be running Fall of the Thran. It's a saga that's first lore counter is destroy all lands. And then it's second and third say each player returns two land cards from their graveyard to the battlefield. The best part about this card though is if we can exile it or just bounce it back to our hand, it's not going to have those second and third lore counters placed on it. And then every single player is going to be set back to having no lands at all. And with our mana rocks on the board, we're going to set ourselves up to win the game easily. But before we can win the game, we've got some other preparations that we need to do first. So let's go through some of those now in tactic number seven, it's coming back to me. First up there's Mine Excavation, which is going to return target artifact or enchantment in our graveyard back to our hand. On top of that it has Conspire, so we can tap two of our untapped white creatures to copy this spell. And then there's Restoration Specialist, which we can sacrifice for a white to return up to one target artifact card and one target enchantment card from our graveyard back to our hand. Now these can each get back something like Fall of the Thran or Mana Breach to really slow down our opponents some more. But the really crucial thing is that they can get back some of those combo pieces that work really well with our commander, but we'll go through those later. And finally there's Recall, which says discard X cards, then return a card from your graveyard to your hand for each card discarded this way, Exile Recall. This is a fantastic card in this deck, we're never going to be short on cards in our hand, so we can get back those perfect cards that we need from our graveyard. But what are some of those ways that make sure that we keep a full hand? Let's go through some of them now in tactic number 8, Know-It-All. First up there's Monastery Siege, which serves a dual purpose for this deck. 
When it comes into play, we can either choose cons or dragons, and if we chose cons, at the beginning of our draw step, we get to draw an additional card, but then we have to discard a card. If we chose dragons, spells our opponent's cast that target us or a permanent that we control cost two more to cast. So this card can either be really great at helping us loot through our deck or helping us protect ourselves and our permanents. And then there's Mind Unbound, which says at the beginning of your upkeep, put a lore counter on Mind Unbound, and then draw a card for each lore counter on Mind Unbound. Again, with this deck, we're playing the long game, so Mind Unbound can provide us with a ton of value throughout the game. Next up, we're going to be running Factor Fiction, which says reveal the top five cards of your library, and opponent separates those cards into two piles. Then we can put one of those piles into our hand, and the other goes into our graveyard. This is a fantastic card that really helps us dig deeper and get those right pieces into our hand. And then there's Intellectual Offering, which is not only a draw spell, but it's also a ramp spell for us. It says choose an opponent, you and that player each draw three cards. And choose an opponent, untap all non-land permanents you control and all non-land permanents that player controls. With the amount of mana rocks that we're running in this deck, this can really help us set ourselves up for some big plays. And then we're going to be running just some straight up good simple instant speed draw. Jace's Ingenuity is going to draw us three cards for five mana. Precognitive Perception does the exact same thing, but it also has Addendum, so if we cast this spell during our main phase, instead we can scry three and then draw those three cards. And finally, with Opportunity, we can draw four cards for six mana. Finally, we've got two big X spells that can take advantage of all the mana that this deck can produce. Epiphany of the Drown Yard is basically going to be a factor fiction, but with an X cost. And Pull from Tomorrow is going to draw us X cards, but then we have to discard a card. Now, drawing cards is great, but sometimes it's even better just to go get that specific card that we need to win. So let's go through some ways to do that in tactic number nine, searching for answers. First up, there's Tamio's Journal, which says, at the beginning of your upkeep, investigate. But instead of sacrificing those clues to draw cards, we can tap to sacrifice three clues to search our library for any card input into our hand. So this card is a fantastic and very flexible card that can either provide us with card draw or tutoring. And then we're going to be running Treasure Mage, which when it enters the battlefield, we can search our library for an artifact card with converted mana cost of six or greater, reveal it, put it into our hand, and then shuffle our library. Luckily for us, our two big finishers are artifacts that cost exactly six mana. So that's why we're also going to be running Ethereal Usher, which we can transmute for one blue blue to search our library for any card with a converted mana cost of six. But our best tutor is actually going to be the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Whir of Invention. Whir of Invention is an instant that costs X blue blue blue. It has improvised, so our artifacts can actually help us cast this spell. It says, search your library for an artifact card with converted mana cost of X or less, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Again, I mentioned that there are two artifacts in this deck that each cost six mana that we want onto the battlefield when our commander's in play. And War of Invention will let us go get either of those, put them directly onto the battlefield, and at instant speed. This means that we can completely shut down our opponents out of nowhere. Basically, as long as we have Lavinia on the battlefield and 9 mana, this card equals win the game. Because if our opponents don't have any responses, there's pretty much nothing that they can do to stop us. This card is absolutely incredible in this deck, and no other card does anything like it, and that's why it's the Golden Pig. But what are those cards that it's going to search for and get? Let's go through them now in tactic number 10, Lock It Down. First up, there's Omen Machine, which says players can't draw cards. At the beginning of each player's draw step, that player exiles the top card of his or her library. If it's a land card, that player puts it onto the battlefield, otherwise that player casts it without paying its mana cost if able. And remember that with Lavinian play, any spell that our opponents try to cast for free are going to be countered. So the only thing that our opponents can do from here is try to cast one of the spells in their hand if they're able to. And if they don't have any way to get rid of Lavinia or Omen Machine, it's going to be game for them. But perhaps an even harder lock on our opponents is Knowledge Pool. Knowledge Pool has Imprint. When it enters the battlefield, each player exiles the top three cards of his or her library. And then whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand, that player exiles it. If the player does, he or she may cast another non-land card exiled with Knowledge Pool without paying that card's mana cost. So with this in play, our opponents basically can't cast any spells, and we still can. So if they don't counter this or have something on the board to deal with either Lavinia or Knowledge Pool, they're done. Again, this is a control deck, so as long as we can get one of these two combinations onto the battlefield, we're pretty much going to be set and be able to control the game long enough to be able to win. Once our opponents can't do anything, we can just destroy their board or bounce everything back to their hand in order to win. Commander damage isn't the quickest way for us to win, but we actually can just win with commander damage with Lavinia. Another way for us to win outside of our combos is with Approach of the Second Sun. It says, if Approach of the Second Sun was cast from your hand and you've cast another spell named Approach of the Second Sun this game, you win the game. Otherwise, put Approach of the Second Sun into its owner's library, 7th from the top, and you gain 7 life. So as long as we can control the board and then draw a few cards, we can just win the game with this. And finally, another way to win is with Tidespound Tyrant. It says, whenever you cast a spell, return target permanent to its owner's hand. So with Tide Spell Time, we can just slowly return all of our opponent's permanents back to their hands to win. Again, since they really can't ramp with mana rocks against our commander, bouncing back their lands is going to be detrimental. There are plenty of ways for this deck to control, lock down our opponents, and win the game. But now that we've gone through the cards that help us win with this deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. First up, there's Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap to sacrifice to search our library for basic land and put into play tapped. 
And then there's Warp Landscape, which can either tap for a colorless, or we can pay two to tap and sacrifice it to search our library for a basic land to put a play tapped. Next up, we're going to be running Azori Skilled Gate, Meandering River, Sajiri Refuge, and Tranquil Cove, each of which enter the battlefield tapped and tap for either a white or blue mana. On top of that, Sajiri Refuge and Tranquil Cove will gain us one life when they come into play. And then there's Azori's Chantry, which also enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, we have to return a land we control back to our hand. It does have the upside, though, of tapping for white blue. And finally, we're going to be running 27 basic lands, including 20 islands and 7 planes. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG player optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Lavinia Azorius Renegade EDH rec deck is going to set you back $696.50, so let's see how we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at just $24.97. Again, Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned in focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. So let's go through some reasonable upgrades to see what some of those ways just might be. First up, there's Armageddon, which comes in at $3.33. It's a sorcery that costs 3 and a white, and it says destroy all lands. Again, once we're set up with enough mana rocks, destroying everyone's lands really puts us ahead. And then there's Sunder, which comes in at $4.01. It's an instant that costs 3 blue blue, and it says return all lands to owner's hands. Like Armageddon, this can really set all of our opponents back, and we're going to be just fine. Next up is Delay, which comes in at $3.39. It's an instant that costs 1 and a blue, and it says counter target spell. If the spell is countered this way, remove it from the game with 3 time counters on it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. If it didn't have suspend, it gains suspend. With our commander in play, this is just basically a 2 mana counter spell since they can't play anything for free. And then there's Fabricate, which comes in at $3.36. Fabricate's the sorcery that costs two in the blue. It says, search your library for an artifact card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. This is a very cheap and effective way for us to go get one of our lockdown pieces. Next up, there's Eye of the Storm, which comes in at $2.77. Eye of the Storm is an enchantment that costs five blue blue. It says, whenever a player plays an instant or sorcery card, remove it from the game. Then that player copies each instant or sorcery card removed from the game with Eye of the Storm. For each copy, the player may play the copy without paying its mana cost. Basically, with our commander in play, our opponents can't cast instants or sorceries, and we can cast a ton of them. Finally, there's Luminarch Ascension, which costs $2.89. It's an enchantment that costs one and a white. It says at the beginning of each opponent's end step, if you didn't lose life this turn, you may put a quest counter on Luminarch Ascension. And then you can pay one and a white to create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying, but only if you have four or more quest counters on it. This is another great control finisher, especially in this deck where we can produce a ton of mana. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you use that decklist link in the description below. Not only will you be getting great prices on TCG Player, but you're also going to be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure that you follow us on social media so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future Commanders for deck tacks. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tack dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel, and then check out some of our playlists on budget Commander decks, Commander-excluded decks, and Break the Bank episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one. <laughs>